Would you turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 12? We're still in this chapter, and there's yet another week. So Matthew 12, and we're going to start at uh, verse, I believe it's 38. I'm using a, one of the Bibles that have been uh, donated to the church, I'm excited to say. If you ever come in and uh, you, you need a Bible for a Bible study or something to borrow, there's a bunch of uh, Bibles in there, and that's exciting. So we're going to start at verse 38, chapter 12, starting at verse 38, and we'll read right on through to 45. Now, Jesus has just been speaking, as you remember. He's been speaking, having this back and forth with the Pharisees. And I'll actually read the, the last two verses there. He said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So will it be with this evil generation. Amen. It's the word of the Lord. With that read, and kind of echoing in our mind, I want to just pull way aside and just tell you, uh, I guess, a story about me. That there was a time before I knew the Lord, right? I think about this in my life because as an adult convert, it's, it's a constant fascination to me. I was 28 years old and did not know the Lord, and then I was 29 years old and did know the Lord. And I've given it a lot of thought as a pastor, like, what accounts for that? What was it that happened? And let me tell you what didn't happen. It was not a matter of me sort of like reading through scripture with some sense of real interest in it. I wasn't 48.5% convinced, and then all of a sudden something pushed me over the top, and it's like, oh, I guess I'm 51.3% now, but I could still be talked out of it. It's not what happened at all. I might put it more like in uh, 1 Peter, and I lost my page there. Let's see. 1 Peter is after all the Roman stuff. Here it is. Okay. 1 Peter 2, one of my favorite verses in Scripture. 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want you to think about that. That's what you are. I want you to own that this morning. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You've been called out of darkness into this marvelous light. For what purpose? To declare the excellencies of him who did it. What a beautiful vision of what the church is about, to declare the excellencies of God Almighty. Here's the thing that's weird, though. I think about myself, and for the life of me, I didn't know I was in darkness. <laughs> Right? If you talk to people all around, all our neighbors who don't know God, who don't believe in God, they don't know they're in darkness. That's what's always mystifying to me. I look back now and it's as clear as day. I was in darkness. More than in darkness, I was in bondage to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I needed deliverance. Well, what happened with me? Well, what happened with me is that I... I was listening to Virginia. I was like, well, how do I pray? You remember, some of you remember this story. It's like, what do I do? How do I talk to God? She says, well, maybe bow, you know, bow down. And, I, and then, and what do I call him? <laughs> she says, father. And then I went by myself and took it from there. I got down on my knees and I said, you know, father, the next thing I know, it's hard to explain this, but the next thing I know, the world was changed. That which I found impossible to believe was impossible not to believe. 
the fact of God's existence was so real to me that it's not like someone can talk me. Have you ever had an argument with like an atheist or not an argument, but just a talk and they're thinking that they're going to talk you out of your faith by an appeal to something or other. And it's like, you must not understand me very well, do you? I don't, I'm not like 55% convinced on this. I know the living God. It's the greatest privilege of my life. What happened is that God shone his light into the darkness. And what happens to the darkness when light is shown into it? It's gone. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because there's something important here about the way God works with us, I think. It's what Jesus is about doing, and it helps us to think in terms of our job for evangelism, in terms of the way salvation works. We talk about religion sometimes, if it's a sort of thing, like, let's sit down and have tea and just discuss religion, you know? It's kind of like, but really, when you get right down to it, what Jesus is doing is saving us from a fire. <laughs> if the fireman comes and your house is on fire, he doesn't say, let's sit down and have tea. Do you want to be, it's like, get out of the house. This is a deliverance that we're talking about here. It's a complete and total change. Now, as much as that works with God, you've maybe all experienced this. You can talk with your neighbors about God, about spirituality, and you can go a long time and not offend them necessarily, right? Have you noticed that? But man, bring up the name Jesus, and in one second, that thing is, is, might be uncomfortable. I have thought about this too for years. What is that with the name Jesus that brings offense so quickly? Have you noticed that? I mean, you can talk about God and, and for a long time. My thought about this, my first guess is kind of, maybe it has to do because in America, the third rail is discussing religious stuff. You know, you can't discuss any sectarian stuff. That's uncomfortable in our society. Maybe because we're so many people from so many backgrounds, that's one thing you can't bring up. We've all decided don't bring up religion. All right, but that's not quite true. Has it, have any of you ever gone to a health club and done yoga at the health club? And what do they say at the end of it? Namaste. It always cracks me up. This is what I'm saying. Namaste. I finally pronounce it right. Everyone's always yelling. It's, I used to say namaste, but it's like namaste. What does namaste mean, by the way? I, I don't even know. I'm so embarrassed. I should have known this before coming in. But, you know, do you, do, you, do you know what's interesting about namaste? No one gets offended at that. Here's this sectarian thing. Here's this, here's this Hindu practice that is like, oh, that's perfectly fine. Bring up the name Jesus in that context. You're offended everybody. Why? What is it about Jesus that's so offensive? <laughs> what is it about Jesus that's so offensive? I think when you think about it a little bit is that with Jesus, there's no middle ground here, right? With Jesus, there's no neutrality. With Jesus, what Jesus is all about is drawing things to a kind of a, a crisis, if you will. You know that word in Greek, crisis? It's the same word as judgment. Jesus comes along, and just the name Jesus forces you either yes or no. Actually, it was interesting, because Steve read this this morning. He read from John 14. I was going to quote John 14:6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, isn't that interesting? When I was a kid, it was, it was a little different. I've seen a change in culture over the years, all right? Like, I don't know, it seems to me that 30 years ago, people were more like, well, there's science truth, and then there's religious truth, and science truth is true, and religion's not true. Have you noticed there's been a change Sort of like where, well, truth is all kinds of things. And Jesus could be a way. I acknowledge that. Jesus is a way, but not the way. Isn't that exactly what offends everyone about Jesus, right? It's this exclusivity. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. How can Jesus be the truth? Did you ever think about that? Remember what we were talking about last week where God imprints reality itself? Jesus comes into the world, imprints it, and says, this is real reality. Trust in this. Amen. The truth and the life. And unsurprisingly, when there's no room for neutrality, people react strongly. Right? I want you to get this. This is not an accident. Jesus came into the world, and this is exactly, importantly, what the whole work, his whole ministry, his whole mission is all about. This isn't an accident. What did he say in Matthew 10? Do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Ho! Oh. That's not the Jesus, the kind of hippie Jesus that you hear about in the press sometimes, right? Do you know what I mean about the hippie Jesus? What's Jesus like? Oh, he's this guy that hangs out with sinners and just kind of hanging out. And he loves, you know, giving those fundamentalists a hard time because he's like, oh, take it easy. Just hang out with the sinners. It's cool, man. That's not this. What's Jesus saying here? Why is Jesus? Ha he does hang out with the sinners, by the way. Why? Because he's affirming sin? No, because he's trying to save them from that because he's unafraid to be with them he's not afraid of being contaminated by them right this is the Pharisee oh I don't want to be near them they'll contaminate me it's like Jesus is not going to be contaminated he's coming in sitting with them to save them out of the fire out of the darkness this is who Jesus is he doesn't come to make peace with the world what does he come he comes to destroy the kingdom of darkness this isn't some accident when we're talking about thy kingdom come, what are we asking for? That Satan's kingdom will be destroyed, root and branch, that people will be delivered from bondage to the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's like being pulled from a fire. I really want you to see this. With Jesus, it's for or against. Whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. He's come to plunder Satan. He's come to break the power of Satan. In other words, this isn't something where we sit back and talk about it. We often talk about Jesus as if it's a matter of, well, let's just engage these ideas, you know, and, and uh, we'll think about it. You can do that with God a long way. You can kind of get all talking about God. But when it comes to Jesus, it's harder, isn't it? Because it demands a verdict. It demands you saying yes or no. There's these two things we say. We'll either say, I'm, I'm good or I'm okay, right? It's the, what Jesus does is attacks this fundamental misconception that we have. And now I'm thinking about myself before I was a believer. I was not ever an atheist. I wasn't one of the, because I kind of think that atheism is just another religion. If you're so convinced that God isn't real, I got to tell you, that's kind of a religion. <laughs> if you think about it, you believe that. I was more of a, a hardline agnostic right? I just, I didn't know whether God existed or not. But the thing is, I was, I was, I was open to the possibility, I suppose. But I, what Jesus does, though, the problem is you can't talk about this. Jesus comes at you and he attacks this very idea that it's like, it's good enough. I'm okay. Right? You ever say this phrase, you hear it when people say, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, someone just did this. I was at lunch with someone in the presbytery, and I said, uh, the waitress comes up, says, do you want some water? I said, no, I'm good. And the guy from the presbytery looks at me and says, no, you're not. <laughs> That's what happens when you go out with a Presbyterian pastor. It was annoying. But it was true. You're not good, right? You think you're good. Or I'm okay. Everything's all right. The, so the thing is, the world is under judgment. You will surely die. Do you understand this? This is a house fire. This is a serious thing. Judgment has been unfurling on the world. So when Jesus speaks about this, this is like the context here. I want to get to the passage, but here it is. Judgment is a personal thing. Like he ended the passage last time. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. You, personal, it's personal, but it's also generational and corporate. That judgment is coming upon this generation. So with that in mind, what do they say to him? Let's pick it up here at verse 38. They say, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answering him said, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now, I want to stop there. They say, we want to see a sign from you. And what does that mean? They want to see something that is going to absolutely and assuredly prove that he's Jesus, that he's the Christ, that he's who he says he is, right? Would you just show us a sign that would prove who you are? Have you ever heard that from your neighbor, from your agnostic family member, friend, neighbor? 
Someone who says, oh, I'd believe in God if he just gave me a sign. I mean, something I could actually believe in, something tangible, right? You've heard this before. Maybe you've thought it before. If only God would give me something, a sign. So they're saying, Jesus, would you, you need to show us a sign here so that we'll believe you. And the first thing you want to think is it's not necessarily a bad thing that God would give a sign. God does this all the time. Let me give you one sign that God gave him pertaining to Jesus. Isaiah 6. Does anyone remember Isaiah 6? A virgin will conceive, right? Here is this thing, something so important is when the Messiah, when the Christ of God comes into the world, here's the sign that's going to attest to this person being who I say it is. A virgin will conceive. Pretty huge, pretty unusual. When that happens, that's a sign. God himself established that. Moses said that when a prophet comes along, hey man, you're sitting in the front, John, so I'm going to pick on you here. John comes along, stands up, and starts declaring himself a prophet. By the way, he's not a prophet. That would be wrong, right? But let's say John declares himself a prophet. We are to test the prophecy. Even in the Old Testament, you don't come along and say, oh, you're a prophet, I have to listen to what you say. No, God says, test the prophet. You test what they say. Moses himself came in, and he was saying to God, when I come back to Egypt, they're not going to believe me. God said, I'm going to give you these signs. Do these couple of things. They'll believe you, right? You're following this, right? That's what a sign is. So Jesus, you might add a little conversation here. Jesus is saying to them, so you want a sign, just like Moses gave people signs. Yeah, that'll do. And then Jesus, you might think at this point, is saying, so everything I've done until now doesn't matter? I mean, did you notice about the healing of the leper? Or healing Simon's mother-in-law? Or healing the centurion's servant at a distance? Or stopping a storm by my word? Or healing the demoniac on the other side of the sea? Do you remember that one? The person in the bondage of Satan who was delivered. How about the paralytic that was healed? How about the little girl who was raised from the dead? How about the two blind men and then the mute man? Where do we stop? Well, let's, what did they say after the healing of the, the two blind men and the mute men? This is what they said. When the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. That's what the crowd said. But you know about crowds, this populace, <laughs> the deplorables, right? Crowds. But what, is the, what did the Pharisee say here? The Pharisee said, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. This was their response to the signs. Then later, one more sign that really should have been convincing, something that was magnificent. I mean magnificent. There was a demon-possessed man that was blind and mute. You're likely to read right past that and think, it's just another miracle. I want you to stop and think about that. A demon-possessed man that was blind and mute. If you want in one person a picture of everything wrong with the world, there it is. A demon-possessed person, someone in the bondage of Satan, in the bondage of Satan who could not see the light and could not give God glory, could not sing praise to God. What does Jesus do? He liberates him from the power of Satan. He opens his eyes that he can see the light, and he opens his lips that he can give God praise. That is the most beautiful thing I can possibly think about what God does. It's personal for me. That's what he did for me. I didn't even know I was blind. I really get that song about I was blind and now I see. The weird thing is I try to think about this. I didn't know I was blind, but I was. I was. And now I can see and I can't unsee. Praise God. Praise God. This is what he did for this man. It's an absolute picture of deliverance. Did the Pharisees rejoice? No. They repeated it and said, he's doing this by the power of Beelzebul. By the power of Satan, he's doing this. Now, let's just get to the point here. You want another sign, do you? I guess all these signs aren't enough, but one more sign that I'll do, you're going to believe. Is that right? And what do you think the answer is? It's like, number one, Jesus is saying, I don't bark on command here. Right? You want another sign? Just do this. No. But number two... Even if I gave you 50 more signs, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it because you're so committed to a world you cannot see it. You will not see it. Let me read. Do you remember the parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus? 
in the Gospel of Luke. It's this wonderful story about Lazarus, this poor man, and then a rich man. They both die, they go off, and the poor man, it's like this reversal of fortune. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham enjoying this, this paradise, and the rich man, meanwhile, is in the fires, right? And he's, he's complaining. And at the end of this whole sig, he, the rich man, he says, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Makes sense, right? Then they'll believe. That'll be awesome. If they go from the dead. And what was the answer? He said to him, If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Interesting story. It's true. <laughs> Do you ever get into sort of discussions with people about this book? They'll say, have you ever heard this one? There's no evidence for Jesus ever, ever existed. And I'm looking at it like, I think there's evidence that Jesus existed. These are first century accounts. What do you want? Yeah, but beside the Bible, the Bible doesn't count. Why doesn't the Bible count? These are the records of Jesus, right? It doesn't make sense. Have you ever run into that kind of discussion? Have you? Oh, interesting. I have. I want to tell you another one. How about this? It's kind of like this radical tenacity to this way of thinking. The name Israel Finkelstein. I love that name. It's just perfect. Israel Finkelstein is an archaeologist in Israel who is committed to the idea of poo-pooing all of Israelite history. If you've never, if you study biblical archaeology, it's a really fun thing if you want to just get agita, <laughs> because people do this kind of stuff. He's made his whole career denying pretty much everything. Ah, there was no real Israel. Israel was a bunch of Bedouins. They were on the fringes of March. There's not even a record. There was not even a King David, right? And he's celebrated for this. Oh, what a brilliant iconoclast, you know? He's, he's amazing. Well, then it turns out a couple of years ago, oh, we found this. And why was he saying this? What about the Bible? It says a lot about David in here. Well, the Bible doesn't matter. That's all, you know, biased. What we need are rocks. Rocks! And so, the archaeology, look what, they found something, an actual rock that said, House of David, Beit David in Hebrew. You think that that would kind of put an end to this. It's like, well, I guess there was a David. Oops. No, he clings tenaciously to it. Nothing has changed. Isn't this interesting? Have you ever noticed how people cling tenaciously even after it's, it should be disproved by now? Right? We have this idea. I'm trying to say this for a reason. We have this idea that we build up our life, our worldview, according to just reason alone. Right? I think of our modern politic, our political discussion is so dysfunctional in our country. You know, we're sitting here saying, I, I, we're, this is by reason alone. You know, but it's not. It's not. We imagine that we are, I'm just by sheer reason, and the other side is completely irrational. It's like, listen, we're looking at the world, and there's a whole level of, of emotional basis of our decision-making. Remember we were talking about this last time. We look at the world, and what Jesus is doing for us is coming into the world and imprinting it and saying, this is truth. This is truth. Walk in this way, because to do otherwise, you will be mistaken. Okay. Why won't they believe? Because they're tenaciously committed to something else. What does he say? There's, no gonna, there's gonna be no sign for this generation except for what? Except the sign of Jonah. Okay, what's the sign of Jonah? Death and resurrection. The death and resurrection of Jonah. And what does that mean in turn? So we, I wanna run through Jonah quickly on this, okay? The book of Jonah. Did this several weeks ago, but it's really fun. We'll do a lightning tour of this book. We often think of Jonah, this is a kid's book, right? Oh yeah, that's what you teach in the children's ministry. It's about Jonah and the whale and ridiculous stories of fish and it's fun, little cartoons. And it's like, you know what? It's a really deep book for grown-ups. okay? Jonah, chapter one. What does it start with? Arise and go. God says to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, go proclaim to them that judgment is coming and call them to repentance. What does Jonah do? He arises and goes the opposite direction because he doesn't want to go there, right? Why did he do that? You might think it's because Jonah was afraid. But it, as it turns out, it's not because Jonah was afraid. I want you to see that what Jonah is about, the book of Jonah, is a mystery answering that question. Why did Jonah run? Why did, it's not because he was afraid. Put that right out of your head. 
Jonah arises and goes the opposite direction. God, of course, as you all know, pursues him. He doesn't get away with it. There's this gigantic storm. He's finally thrown overboard. He's sinking down, down, down into the deep, 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 and is swallowed then by a great fish. And chapter one ends there. Jonah is as good as dead. Isn't that interesting? Jonah runs away from God and then ends up in the deep, 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 swallowed by a fish. Chapter 2, what happens then? God, by his grace, delivers him. The fish comes, <laughs> spits him onto land. Jonah flies out. There he is on land. He's delivered, and he ends the chapter with this psalm. He's like, salvation is from the Lord. Jonah is saved by God's grace. Amen. Chapter 3 begins the book all over just like it began. Chapter 3, arise, go to Nineveh, and proclaim to them that they need to repent. And Jonah, and, and Jonah did. Isn't that, I find that so encouraging, brothers and sisters. That is great. Just like Peter, when he messed up so completely with Jesus, Jesus didn't say, sorry, Peter, you screwed up. You're never coming back here again. He recommissioned him. He, he affirmed his love for him. And he said, now get to work. Brothers and sisters, he's done this with me before. I have dropped the ball. And God picks us up and dusts us off and says, I still love you. Now get to work. I hope you've had this experience because it's so encouraging to know that we're, it's not, we're not sitting on a razor's edge of performance and if, that if we fail the test, we're brushed aside. God loves you. And he's called you to his service. So with Jonah, even after he ran away, now chapter 3, he goes to Nineveh, and what does he do? He proclaims, and what happens in Nineveh? They repent! Yay! Isn't that great? No. Chapter 4, Jonah is angry. And now he explains, this is why I ran away. This is why I didn't want to do what you told me, because I knew, I knew what you're like, God. I knew you'd forgive them. I want you to see the irony of Jonah. Jonah is about a man that was saved by grace who's angry at God for saving the Ninevites by grace. Jonah is about a man that's saved by grace who's angry at God for showing grace. God then gives him this parable. And it's, this, it's kind of a living parable. He has a vine grow up around him that protects him from the sun. Do you remember this? And Jonah's, ha Jonah's happy. Oh, this is cool. I get to watch what happens. We'll see. And then God sets a worm that eats the vine. And now he's exposed to the sun again. Simple parable. You remember Jonah's reaction? Jonah's angry again. I'm so angry. I don't even want to live in a world like this. Why is he so angry? Because you killed the vine. You know, why did you even give it to me if you're going to take it away? Jonah's being petulant, but you could at least see this. And then God's answer is beautiful and utterly deep. He says, you're all pitying the vine. I pity my children. This is a message for Israel. It's a message for the church. And you might be thinking, if you're Jonah, what are you, not the Assyrians. Wait, you're, and he is talking about the Assyrians. Listen to this from Isaiah. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. <laughs> Do you see that? Do you want to know what the big picture of the whole Bible is all about? It's about these promises that God has made to Abraham that one day through the seed, through that promised seed are going to flow to the nations. That's why we're here right now. We are part of that blessing. This great wave of salvation has been pushing forth from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth for 2,000 years. It's swept up you and me. We're here today to worship the God of Israel. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And that miracle is pressing forth beyond us, through us. That is an awesome fact. What Jesus is doing when he's talking about this, I want you to think about this. God's plan from the beginning has been to do this. Jesus is like, you know, salvation is from the Jews. Remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? You know, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know. That salvation is from the Jews, and this is what we're bringing this good news of salvation, right? Jonah, what do we learn from Jonah here? We have basically a man who was resurrected, don't we? He was spit out. You were dead, but now you're alive. You have a resurrected man proclaiming repentance to the nations. 
And now in Jesus, you have one greater than Jonah, one who didn't run away, one who didn't rebel against God, one who did everything he was supposed to do, but died for Israel. In effect, died for Jonah. And now that resurrected one, the proclamation of the kingdom of God is going forth to the nations. What's the good news here? The good news is, like we hear here, salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. If you want a picture of evangelism that really gets me excited, this is what we're called to do. We don't have to trick people into coming to church. We don't have to trick them with fancy, you know, things that we do here, you know, wonderful dinners, all this other kind of stuff. All that's great, whatever. But the real thing that we desire is people to come to know the living and true God, to join us in worship, that we might be brothers and sisters under the fatherhood of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ. There is no higher exaltation for humanity than that. This is what we're inviting people. Come and worship the living and true God. What a beautiful picture. But guess what? It's not just that. There's a thing attached to it, and it's repentance. Acts 17, time, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's appointed, and of this he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. All right, this is it. I want to kind of get to this. The sign of Jonah, the sign that we're given, what's the sign that we have as a church? Is none other than the vindicated, the risen Christ. This is our sign. It is the sign that, believe it or not, this is it. The vindicated Christ. Jesus is the yes and amen of all of God's promises. Everything that God has promised in the Bible is yes and amen in Jesus. And you remember from the last two weeks, what are we supposed to say when God imprints reality so that we, that's it, that's the truth. What are we supposed to say in return? Amen. Amen. Last thing I want to say, because I know, is that time right? Oh, yeah, that's why. You gave me that present. Thank you, by the way, but it's your fault. I'm claiming three minutes from the floor. Thank you, gentlemen from Iowa. All right. Now, this is really important. I feel better now. It's not my fault. <laughs> I was like, wait, Prince, what happened here? I was... It's Reformation Sunday, right? I want to explain one thing. Let's understand the Reformation in one easy thought. You could get all deep about stuff, but this is, this is the Reformation. Why I love the Reformation. It comes down to one word, assurance. Assurance. Isn't that interesting? Assurance. I'm sure that every one of you have Catholic friends and neighbors, right? And Catholic friends and neighbors, I have a lot of them that love the Lord, that know Jesus, you know, all this other, they're, you know, they love the Lord. They do. But what they lack is assurance. Have you ever talked to a Catholic about heaven and the hope of heaven? And they'll say in response to this, it's like, yeah, isn't it a little presumptuous what you're talking about there? You don't know if you're going to make it to heaven because you don't know. I mean, tomorrow you could blow it, right? I mean, you don't know. I mean, what makes you so audacious is to know. And here's the answer. It's the Reformation. I know because it's not based on me but on God's promise. God promised it, and I believe it. That's why I know. It's a hugely important thing. Understand that this isn't something in myself. When we talk about being justified by faith, when I'm saved by faith, that faith is this thing that is powerful. It's not some thing in me. I'm not saved by some force of my will. It's not the strength or constancy of my faith. It's the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the power that saves us. And all we do is trust it. We get into this. Now, here's the, that's the great part of the Reformation. And I want to hear God's amen. 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 It's so great to know my salvation isn't something I have to attain. It's not some hill I have to climb. I don't have to figure all this out. Jesus did it. Jesus did it for me and for you. All you have to do is trust it. Trust God's promises. Trust God's amen. Say amen to God's amen. Now, this is the catch, and then I'll wrap it up. It's, we get into this confusion sometimes where we say, if we're saved by faith, well, what's the rest of it? Do I have to, you know, that's all I have to do? It's like, no, you're saved by a faith alone, but that doesn't remain alone. 
Remember this? Repentance is critical in our life together. If we believe what God has said, then we're going to walk in that way. This is what we're called to do. We can't set faith and repentance against one another. That faith and repentance are the two engines of Christian life. This is how God is taking us from where we are to glory by faith and repentance, day by day. What is faith? Westminster Shorter Catechism, right? Faith in Jesus Christ, resting and relying on him, right? That he's, gonna, that he's all I need. What is repentance? It's where a sinner, out of a true sense of his own sin, an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief in his heart turn from that sin, away from it to God, with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. This is what we're called to do, brothers and sisters, today. Faith and repentance. Repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you as we do week after week. Thank you for this privilege. As we abide in your presence, Lord, we pray that we would be faithful witnesses, that we would leave this place and be used by you to call others through our words, through our witness, through our example, through our life, to reflect the light of your glory. We acknowledge it, Lord, that in this darkness, what a privilege it is to shine the light of Christ. So, Heavenly Father, be glorified again. And as we prepare to sing your praises, thank you, Lord, for this privilege on a Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen.